Hi, everybody. Siobhan Sarna here with Stephen Wright. I'm the founder of uh, SIBO SOS and the book. Stephen, the book is now out in Polish. Thank you very much. I World love domination. that. I'm so excited. And uh, we are very, very happy to have you here, everybody. Thank you. We're going to be talking about leaky gut today. And there are very few people who know as much about leaky gut as my very special guest, Stephen Wright. He is an engineer by trade, so I love his analytical approach to things. And before anybody else, pretty much, was doing all this online education, Stephen and friend were absolutely educating people as pioneers of online free education to people about gut health. It was called SCD Lifestyle. And... I always ask Stephen, because this was back in 2015 when he and I started talking, you know, when are you going to come out with your own supplements, et cetera? And he was like, I'm not doing it. <laughs> and uh, finally he did. And it's very niche. It's very specialized. And it's the things he couldn't find in the marketplace. So I just wanted to mention that to you. We're going to be talking about it at the end. But the main focus today is what you can do to help your leaky gut and the new research that has emerged. Um, so with that being said, Stephen, hello, good to have you. Uh, one rule is be nice or be gone. Please do not use the chat during the presentation. If you have a question, pop into the Q&A box so I can manage it. And um, Clarissa is behind the scenes. If you have any tech questions, that is where the chat is appropriate. All right, Stephen, tell us about Leaky Gut and what's going on, man. Yeah, well, I mean, like you just said before we got recording here, um, I think it's been a decade since my first blog articles about leaky gut were were live. Uh, we'll have to check the Wayback Machine or just the website, but I think it's been over a decade now. And back then it was very like, I was like, oh my gosh, this is this is the reason why I have all my issues, my skin issues, um, you know, food sensitivities, like this, this leaky gut thing happens and then it connects to all these autoimmune conditions. It's one of the biggest dominoes that falls and triggers these chronic health conditions for so many folks and no one's talking about it. Let's just get it out to the world. And at the time we were like number one on Google and number two on Google was a, uh, was Harvard site saying leaky guts, not real. And like that was going on for years. We had the solving leaky gut course, which thousands of people did. And I'm here to tell you that I think the cool thing is, is that gastroenterologists now, at least some of them recognize that intestinal permeability is an issue. It is part of the, the thing. The connection to autoimmune conditions has not been uh, like broken, like no one's un, like unproven that connection. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it's come a long way. And I got to say that I was wrong. I was totally wrong about uh, what I was teaching and the protocols I was creating and working with Dr. Tom O'Brien and many other doctors at the time, um, we were wrong about leaky gut in a few very, very important ways. And I think that's why we see some folks able to like reverse it, you know, with certain supplements and certain protocols. And then majority of folks just continue to fight it for, for many years. Why don't you just take a moment here and by the way, welcome. I know a lot of you are coming on in to just define what leaky gut is. Yeah. So, so previously, and you can watch like probably a hundred clips on the internet, you'll see me doing this where I'm basically talking about the cells in your gut are one layer thick. And so this would be like, my hand would be like the bloodstream. And then these are be our little cells and they have like rubber bands or tight junctions that keep them tight. And when those, when those rubber bands failed, anything could go from the gut into the bloodstream and vice versa. And there was no regulation. And so these tight junctions were the sort of regulators. And back in a decade ago, even uh, 15 years ago, that was what the research said is that these tight junctions were the key to um, tightening up your gut. And if we could only stop them from breaking or, or getting lax, then we could fix this. Um, but that's not completely true. The, the essence of that is still tr true. Um, that has not been, um, you know, unfounded at this point, but there's more layers to it, which, which explains why certain people heal and other people don't. So leaky gut is still the concept of it is things are getting into your body 
um, that shouldn't be there, such as uh, toxins from bacteria, such as food particles that are the wrong size. Um, these things are able to interact with your immune system and your bloodstream. Your body gets very pissed about that. That inflammation, those cytokines go systemic and wherever your genetic weak links are, it will attack that. So if you have you know, rheumatoid arthritis, if you have lupus, if you have Hashimoto's, if you have celiac disease, these are all manifestations first starting with uh, inflammation coming out of the gut and from this leaky gut. Uh, however, we now know that there's a there's several layers of defense and the tight junctions <clears throat> we're getting all the blame, but, but really they're kind of like the last sort of line of defense in some ways. Um, there's actually four layers. There's intestinal alkaline phosphatase, then there's your mucosal layer, and then there's your tight junctions. And then there's also these things called defensins, which most people know about secretory IgA. There's other compounds like that. And so your tight junction shouldn't get all the pressure. Um, it wasn't their fault the whole time. A lot of other systems had to fail for them to fail. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, and by the way, we will send out a replay of this in case anyone's wondering, because it's getting good. Okay. So what causes leaky gut, Stephen? So there's like, most things, uh, most chronic conditions, there's like a giant boatload of them, right? right. Um, for instance, we know that the moment you have a concussion, your your blood brain barrier becomes leaky and so does your gut. So there's there's research that shows you can have a physical trauma. One day you're good. Next day you get in a car crash, you hit your head on the steering wheel, you could have leaky gut. So there's there's legitimate um, traumas that happen, but then there's also this the ongoing accumulation of trauma, such as antibiotic use, uh, cesarean sections, um, inflammation from eating gluten or cliadin or other sort of proteins you can't break down, um, infections such as SIBO, anything that sort of like raises the inflammation potential or destroys your mucosal pathways, your intestinal alkaline phosphatase expression. Um, these types of things will increase the likelihood of leaky gut. Okay. Is there a test for leaky gut? And then we'll get to the solution. Yeah. Yep. So there's there's a lactulose mannitol test is the sort of like gold standard test. And um, I mean, it has a lot of data points, so it's it's pretty it's a pretty solid test. It's not the easiest test to get done these days, um, but a lot of people can do that. Uh, you can also do like a food sensitivity panel. And if you see like a hundred food sensitive, like if you see more than 10 food sensitivities, pretty much the only way to really develop those is through a leaky gut. So you could do a food sensitivity panel. And if you're someone who's like, I haven't eaten watermelon in two years. And then I, all these other things like figs and apricots and beef, how could beef, how could I, you know, that happen? Well, that would happen because you're eating those things on a regular basis and your gut is leaking so bad that your immune system's creating antibodies or uh, cytokines to this food that's coming in every day. So um, there's, uh, I, I would say those are the two like easiest tests to kind of look at. Um, there are some newer stuff coming on the market, but we don't really need to get into that. Okay. And what about the stool tests that uh, reveal like high zonulin? Yeah. Yep. So the stool testing for, for high zonulin, there's also blood, blood markers for zonulin. Um, you know, these things also, so, so the issue is that no one's really run like a lactulose mannitol versus a stool zonulin versus a serum blood zonulin. And how do we make sense of these? And then if we run a food sensitivity panel with these markers, like how do we, what's this, what's the specificity and the failure rate of these various tests? But if your symptoms match the profile and then you have one positive test um, or your symptoms match completely, but your test isn't positive, it's still really likely that you have it going on. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So what can we do to fix it? Yeah. So um, the, the usual sort of path forward still applies, which is number one, try to stop whatever's happening, like whatever's causing it to not heal itself. So eliminate the factors that could be causing um, damage to the gut. So if you're eating gluten, if you're eating grains, stop doing that. If you're eating a bunch of toxic seed oils or things like that, please stop doing that. Um, if you live in a moldy house or you, um, 
you know, you're in contact with pesticides all day because you're spraying them in your garden for your job. You know, do, stop doing that stuff is really going to help. But what we now also know is that that's not going to heal it. That's just going to stop further damage. Like diet doesn't heal leaky gut. We have to rebuild the pathways. And that was one of the things that I was a little wrong about in the past is that diet alone could fix, you know, years and years of damage. Mm. Um, I don't, I don't believe that's true anymore. Um, and I think it's, it's borne out by the sort of, I call them like uh, the sort of like health warriors out there who've been fighting for years trying to figure this out and they haven't gotten better and their diets are like, you know, top 1% in the world. Yeah. Um, and so we need to find products that rebuild those various pathways. So intestinal alkaline phosphatase, mucosal layers, tight junctions, and then secretory IgA and the other defensive and compounds. And so you can, you can kind of piecemeal those supplements together. So for instance, um, there was a study, I think, I think you might've mentioned it uh, a couple of months ago about curcumin and boswellia in SIBO patients, and it improved outcomes. Now, curcumin, uh, the world is out there arguing about what's the best bioavailability and how can I get it, you know, force it through the, the microbiome and force it through the mucosal layers and force it through the gut using black pepper and bioparin and, you know, the, the research kind of suggests it doesn't need to go in your blood to have those effects. In fact, curcumin supplementation, I would do it without any of those extracts and I would reject all of that stuff. And I would say that the research actually shows that curcumin uh, by itself in 90 to 95% extract raises intestinal alkaline phosphatase. So there's basically two compounds that are amazing at raising intestinal alkaline phosphatase, curcumin and butyrate. And so you can try either one or both together, but what if all the joint stuff and the brain and the anti-inflammatory stuff that we associate with curcumin is actually because we're raising intestinal alkaline phosphatase, which is uh, grabbing onto LPS. LPS are the, like the worst toxins in the world for your body to deal with. And so IAP's number one job is to uh, grab on and break those and get them out of your body. And so let's say that you're someone with an autoimmune condition that's related to your joints. You're having all this joint pain. You look at the research and you're like, oh, a thousand milligrams of curcumin. Maybe if I take this supplement that has uh, black pepper, then I only have to take less of it. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say that's probably actually wrong because maybe what's happening is those joint pains are showing up because those toxins are getting through your gut and then going to your joints. If we just take the regular curcumin powders, that raises the IAP, that helps grab those toxins and get them out of your body. And so um, we'll talk about tributyrin in a little while, but for now, I want to at least say, you know, curcumin is something that can be very helpful for anyone with a gut condition, including SIBO. And I would stay away from all the modifiers out there where it's trying to force it into your body. Right. Okay. Is that in your line yet? Do you have, do you have that yet? <laughs> I don't have that yet. Okay, we, uh, that's on the list of to-dos right there. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. I mean, I if you're wondering like what I take, I sort of rotate between anything with BCM95 in it or a 95 or higher percent extract. So there's a lot of products out there. Um, you know, so I, again, I try to handle, we'll come out with something like that in the future, but I try to handle at least the products that aren't commercially available yet right. at, a, at a decent clip. So yeah, right. Great. So like that's taken care of by other people. So why would you do that? So that makes sense, even though, you know, when you have nothing else to do, that'd be great. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the next layer is the mucosal. You got to, you got to heal the mucosal lining. So now in the past, uh, there's a lot of cool stuff around like herbs, right? So the Ayurvedic people in the naturopathic people have really been dealing with this stuff for a long time using slippery elms and the sort of uh what's that word with the m mucosinage or um mucinogenic yes added an n mucinogenic anyway yes we know things to help with the mucous membrane yes yeah, so if you if you go google leaky gut powders you'll look at the back of them and there's a hundred of them out there but the same formula is the same or the formulas are usually the same they just use different herbs like slippery elm and things like that as part of how they're trying to heal it. And one of the reasons why is likely uh, they knew somehow that the mucosal membranes were disrupted 
for the leaky gut. Unfortunately, if you try to go and look in the literature and see like what dosage actually works for the largest percentage of people, that data is not really available. And it doesn't look like the studies have been done yet. And so I think we get into this issue where people just jam all kinds of those herbs together in a formula and say, mm, I hope that works, right? right? Versus we have plenty of data now on butyric acid showing that it upregulates MUC2 gene, which is the main mucin, uh, mucin producing gene to increase uh, mucous membrane thickness, production, all these types of things. So there's better alternatives um, like tributyrin, like butyric acid that can rebuild your mucus pathways. Um, now, the next thing that people would normally add in there would be glutamine. And glutamine is really cool. It's very helpful um, for damaged, uh, damaged anything really. Like if you have a burn patient in burn wards, they give like 80 grams of L glutamine to um, extreme burn patients. It's helps them heal faster. There's study on like rebuilding your muscles uh, using L-glutamine. And so if you're deficient in, in glutamine, like it's going to be, um, hard for you to repair damage in your intestines and having more of it helps with tight junction expression and it helps heal. However, it never really totally fixes all of the issues down there. And so that like, I was part of the camp that was like a high dose of glutamine guy. And I was talking about that for years, still helpful, but I didn't realize that all I was doing was really helping with the sort of the cell structure and the cell, uh, the tight, tight junction structure. Basically I was missing all these other areas. And so, um, if you're doing L-glutamine for leaky gut, that's cool. Keep it up. But just know that if there's anything else that's causing these, these tight junctions not to heal up, you probably need something else that helps express it. And again, butyric acid and tributyrin will help do that. So there's, there's other ways to do it if it hasn't worked so far. Okay. And, and so what is butyrate? So butyrate is the outcome of either prebiotics or, or basically fermentable fibers interacting with probiotics. It's sort of like the probiotics um, poop. It's, it's their metabolites. It's one of them. And so, uh, Prebiotics are eaten by probiotics. They give off postbiotics. Postbiotics is this collection of metabolites, one of which is called short-chain fatty acids. Butyric acid is one of those, and it's typically considered the most health-promoting promoting of those. So <clears throat> I don't know if that simplifies things, but butyric acid is kind of necessary for the intestinal environment to run. It's the preferred fuel source for your colonocytes. Um, it helps suck oxygen out of the microbiome. So it keeps it low oxygen, which is what we want in there for anaerobic bacteria to grow anaerobic, meaning without oxygen. So if we don't have enough butyric acid, the cells will do like normal glucose metabolism, things like this oxygen content builds up inside the intestines. We're sitting here taking all these probiotics and prebiotics and gut healing fibers and nothing's working, right? Our dysbiosis is still there. Yeah. Maybe zonulin markers are still there. And one of the reasons why is that the oxygen is just too high in the gut. And so you can take uh, butyric acid through either the first generation products, sodium butyrate, or the second generation products, tributyrins, and begin to heal all these things. That's, that's the cool thing about it. Like people when people start to like dive deep into this, because I know that there's there's like 10-year warriors on this show right now, and there's people who just learned that leaky gut was a thing five minutes ago. So if you're one of those 10-year warriors, you're going to be like, hey, man, the microbiome's mostly in the large intestine. And I'm like, yeah, it is. It's mostly at the top of the large intestine and the, the bottom of the lower uh, small intestine. How do we, if, if we're not getting butyric acid into the large intestine, it's not matter. It doesn't do anything. Well, that's not actually true. The cool thing is that butyric acid in the small intestine does confer all the same benefits um, down into the large intestine. And I think part of the reason why is what it's doing is raising that IAP. It's raising the mucosal pathways. It's helping to promote the microbiome being more diverse and healthier. And I think uh, that's part of you know increasing secretory IgA as well. We'll get to that in a second. That's the fourth layer of leaky gut. Um, 
if people are still confused about like how could butyric acid in the small intestine help SIBO and help this issue down that that's happening in the, in the large intestine, I think it has to do with what it's doing to the cells all the way down. Okay. All right. So let's talk about the IgA. Have a sip. Everybody take a breath. There's a lot, but it's so good. Yeah. So, so secretory IgA, let's say you just wanted to raise that. Let's say you did a stool test. You're dealing with a, a SIBO, a, a CIFO, a candida, or an ongoing H. pylori infection, some other infection, and it, and it shows you low secretory IgA on one of your tests. The most studied way to bring that up in, in actual human studies is with beta-glucans. So you can take 250, 500 milligrams of beta-glucans and raise sec secretory IgA. Um, this compound basically helps detoxify other issues going on. It's not as much about LPS, and it's more about... Um, other bacteria, viruses, uh, food particles that look weird. It's sort of just globbing on and helping to get rid of junk in your intestines that we don't want there. Um, luckily, again, butyrate upregulate secretory IgA expression as well. But say you wanted to like not take tributyrin X and you're like, hey, that guy was cool, but I don't want to take his product. I would say you need to be on like curcumin. You're going to have to be on L-glutamine. Uh, you're going to want to be on beta-glucans and probably some sort of leaky gut powder that has those herbs in it, the slippery elms and those types of herbs. Um, alternatively, you could let most of those things go and just try a, a tributyrin X or something like that for uh, two months and see if the issues get better or go away. And so I think that's sort of the message I wanted to bring here today is that um, if you've made progress on your leaky gut, um, that's awesome. And, uh, it might be because you had maybe two of those four products on board, right. And you just yeah. needed a few extra products. Um, and if you do make progress, the, the ability to tolerate foods, the ability to get rid of inflammation, lower your pain, all these things are really are possible. It's very, it's really exciting. And yes, there is a relationship between leaky gut and SIBO. Um, and so for those of you who are wondering about that, as SIBO does cause it, think about how much bloating and how much distension is happening. This is just my non-scientific theory in the intestines. And, you know, that would like, you know, stretch things out again, non, non-proven theory. Steve, when we talk, so a couple of things, I want to talk to you about holozymes for a second. And then I want you to show us if you have a bottle of tributyrin X, because mine's downstairs in the kitchen. Um, we do have a discount for your products. They are, uh, I'll ask Clarissa to put the link in the chat if anyone's interested in trying some of these things. Also, Steve has a really good Facebook group where you can get additional support once you pick up any of the products. So that's excellent. He's also given us a coupon that's automatically applied at checkout. So sometimes people write me, I don't see the coupon. No, no, it's automatically applied at checkout and uh, Clarissa will pop it into the chat. So that being said, holozymes is my like miracle. I have six bottles in my house, one by my bed, one on the kitchen table, one here at the office. I mean, I carry one in my purse because when I didn't use this, I was really suffering sometimes. And when I use this, like I'm able to eat so much more, I'll say comfortably and a broader spectrum, which ultimately makes my microbiome so much happier. Like I ate some beets. Okay. Forgot to take this. Not a good idea. I tried the beets again because I'm trying to get those, you know, foods for the happy bacteria. And it was like, just so not an issue. Everybody's results are going to vary. None of this is medical advice. This is just our insight. You talk to your practitioners about it. Use your wisdom, of course, please. And what made you develop holozymes and what, what is a digestive enzyme? For yeah. I mean, digestive enzyme enzymes break down things in nature. So, and digestive enzymes are enzymes specifically that we humans need to break down our fat lipase, break down our carbohydrate amylase, break down our protein proteases. But then we also have very specific ones. Like most people are familiar with lactose deficiency. Well, that's lactase enzyme. You stop producing the lactase enzyme among other enzymes. So um, yeah, so holozyme I developed because like I, there are some really good curcumin products out there, like the BCM95 extract products, um, but there was not an enzyme product that I 
could get behind. And I've tried as many as I could. And so what I found out was the reason why most of them were failing for myself as well as for others was their lack of I don't know, basically combining pancreatic enzymes and brush border specialty enzymes, as well as missing the mineral cofactors. And that was the big key. That's the patent inside of Holozyme. That's why if you turn over the bottle, you'll see over 200 milligrams of minerals. Um, those minerals are there to uh, donate their electrons to the enzymes so that when they're in your body, um, they're not pH sensitive. They can work even if you have low acid, even if you have other sorts of GI um, issues. And so, yeah, Holozymes was, was really my answer for myself, as well as for other people, um, who struggle with food sensitivities, bloating, um, IBS, those types of things. And so, uh, we'll circle back to SIBO and, and leaky gut in a second, but anything that increases inflammation in the small intestine or the large intestine is going to increase leaky gut chances and reduce healing potential. It's also going to oversensitize your immune system so that you'll have reactions to foods, you'll have reactions to your environment, things like that. And so one of the biggest, uh, I think, things that we really still don't appreciate most about SIBO is that if you remove the food source, we were just actually talking about it seconds before we went live, which is you go on a... Um, Oh, shoot. What are my words today? Elemental if, diet. If you go on an elemental diet, you're essentially stripping out the food sources for the bacteria, for, for the SIBO. And so one of the reasons why the elemental diet is so effective is it's literally removing almost all the potentiality for it to grow. One other way to do that, unless it except for like going on that specific elemental diet is using enzymes and things like this that actually allow your body to absorb the nutrients before the bacteria have the option to eat them. So it's not a full replacement for that at all, but like bridging off of the elemental diet or somebody who's dealing with ongoing SIBO and bloating, if you're not on enzymes, you're sort of giving the bacteria more of an optionality to be there and to grow. That's and so- yeah, so so enzymes and HCL are super important for just removing the barriers to getting rid of SIBO, uh, increasing the odds that it'll still be there. Um, the SIBO continues to make the leaky gut happen. I think mostly, other than the inflammation damage and the cytokine damage, but mostly because of just the extra LPS. The more bacteria you have, the higher the LPS burden inside of your gut. Like these are just like, it's just a, I don't know, you throw peanut butter out on the street, nature responds, right? Animals right. come to eat it. Right. If you have extra bacteria, you'll have extra dead bacteria. And those extra dead bacteria are going to be LPS. And those LPS need to be detoxified with intestinal alkaline phosphatase um, and gotten rid of. And so again, if we lower intestinal alkaline phosphatase, now we have extra toxins hitting the mucosal barrier, hitting the tight junctions, um, all the other defensins are getting exhausted, trying to deal with it. So I would say that I don't know that leaky gut causes SIBO. I don't know that SIBO technically causes leaky gut, but I think it's a, a significant contributing factor to ongoing leaky gut. I agree with that. I agree with that. Um, okay. Here's a question for you from Davey. Well, first of all, I'll shout out Carla. Stephen is one of the first people who resonated with my symptoms at least 10 years ago and on some health summit. And so I joined SCD Lifestyle back in the day, uh, but couldn't do that diet. So grateful to Siobhan, hi, for bringing him back on the radar and to him for the supplements, especially Tri-X. So they're very nice, Carla. Thank you. That's what we love to hear. Uh, Davey is saying he's been fighting leaky gut for years. He has only one cup of black coffee a day and maybe occasionally some heavy cream. Is coffee bad for leaky gut? Um, so coffee has some, so coffee is actually extremely complex, uh, properties like the, the molecules inside coffee and the oils inside coffees that we put in our mouth, um, are actually very complex. And so for some folks, especially if you have mucosal damage, coffee can, can be very irritating to the gut. And for other folks, if they have pretty bad, like adrenal hormone related issues, the extra caffeine burst will cause, um, more cortisol um, work for the body to do to sort of manage that, which increases blood sugar instability. And so for 
some people, when they're on their healing journey, I think giving up black coffee is a really good idea and worth a test, just worth a test, like try it out for a week or two. Okay, that's great. Um, so what are the symptoms of leaky gut? I want to go over that again. Can we know if we have it without doing a test? Yeah, yep. So um, <laughs> unfortunately, I took down our solving leaky gut quiz, but that would have been nice to give to people for free. Uh, essentially, so the biggest risk factors, do you have an autoimmune condition? Do you have an active, is it an active autoimmune condition? That's like a huge red flag. Um, do you have ongoing unexplained rashes? Uh, do you have ongoing unexplained joint pains, body aches, pains like that? Do you have food sensitivities? Do you have brain fog? Um, do you have any other ongoing inflammatory like symptoms? These could include things like asthma. Like it doesn't have to be located in the gut. It could, it travels systemically. So if you're like, no, I'm cool. I'm just like trying to gain weight and look hot or something or, or lose weight and look hot. Like maybe you don't have leaky gut, but if you have a chronic health condition, most of the time leaky gut is involved at some, um, some capacity or another. And remember I said it, but in case you missed it, um, can, traumatic brain injuries can cause leaky gut and it's known to cause it within hours. So in a traumatic brain injury, by the way, isn't just someone who's like got brain surgery and is, you know, bleeding from the ear. It can be a horse kicking you. It can be the softball that plunks you on the head and you're like, oh no, oh, I'm okay. I'm okay. No, it's okay. I'm okay. Got it. You know, <gasps> but like, are you? So, you know, the, that's just an example of TBIs, traumatic brain injuries. Um, and there's lists and lists and it's a progression. So when you were little adds up to when you were a teenager, which adds up to when you were in college, which adds up to when you clunked your head on the SUV the other day. So it is accumulation. And um, Kaylee Sandberg Lewis, Stephen Sandberg Lewis's brilliant wife, Dr. Stephen Sandberg Lewis's brilliant wife, um, she suggests putting a note on the refrigerator. And just every time you remember, like I know that when I was in third grade, my sister's boyfriend and she were up in the tree and I was sitting on the swing below and they had a staple gun. Don't ask me why they were trying to put the swing up with a staple gun. And it dropped on my head and there was blood. Like I'm like, bleeding from the head. I'm three or fourth, whatever, third or fourth grade. I still remember that. Right. But it takes me a second to remember that. So just write it all down and see, you know, how it stacks up. We're working on a masterclass, by the way, on traumatic brain injuries and the gut moving on. Robin wants to confirm what is LPS. If you could repeat that, please, Stephen. Yeah, it's lipopolysaccharide. Um, so, or no, lipopolys. Yeah, lipopolysaccharide. Right? Yeah, you got yeah. it. Yeah. Um, so it's an endotoxin. It's part of the uh, bacterial uh, like cell wall usually, and um, it's it's normally occurring. So it's like you like just like FODMAPs, you can't have a life without LPS. Uh, your oral microbiome makes LPS every single day. You swallow it every single day. Your gut on average makes three grams, three 3,000 milligrams of intestinal alkaline phosphatase every day to help you detoxify this stuff. So this is just normal. The issue is when it becomes abnormal due to either you have low I, IAP, you can't detoxify enough of it, um, or you know, there's just too much burden coming in. And it could be from your oral microbiome. It could be from the food you're eating. It could be from like SIBO or something else. Okay. So, and Kieran Krishnan explains lipopolysaccharides is like painful and toxic. Like that, that's his, like that. When I think of them, that's automatically what I think of. I just like skip the technical stuff and get to the like end result there. Yeah. Um, I think of sepsis. Sepsis is when uh, LPS overwhelms your body and you die basically, usually. Okay. Some people make it back, but most don't. Okay, there you go. Yeah, that's it. All right. I wish I had a picture of a bunny rabbit or a little unicorn or something <laughs> to show you all to like cheer you up again uh, and reset our central nervous systems after hearing that. But it's a fact. And um, this is where, you know, sepsis is serious. My brother-in-law died of it and after a digest a intestinal surgery. Anyway, moving on. I gotta, I gotta move on from that. So, um, here's some other. Let's see. What are the exact symptoms we just talked about that, George? And um, okay. Oh, 
is holozyme safe to take if you have stomach irritation? Um, there's no way to say yes or no, except for you to try. And then we have a 60 day money back policy. So we'll just give you a refund if it, if it doesn't work out. If you're somebody who has active ulcers, probably don't try it first, focus on healing your active ulcers, but, um, most people tolerate holozyme. Uh, oh, I just saw it. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Here it is. When do we take the timing of our HCL, and by the way, he does have an HCL product, or digestive enzymes. We get this question every time. I'm so glad you brought it up, Susan. Before, during, or after, or both, or in between, what's the timing for each, Stephen? So the ideal timing is right about your first bite of the meal. So if you can take your HCL and enzymes with your first bite or right before your first bite of the meal, that is the ideal timing. But please do not let perfection get in the way of your healing journey, which it's very easy speaking as a perfectionist. Um, and one of the reasons why I'm a little slow with my brain today is being up all night thinking about things. Do not let uh, perfection or was it the enemy of good? The enemy of good is perfectionism, something like that. Like yeah. just get it done. If, if it's going to be perfect, you will perhaps not do it and be paralyzed, but at least do it. Exactly. I'm sure there's a more eloquent way to say that, but okay. <laughs> um, Amy, hey, Amy, how you doing? Good to see you again. Uh, when can, what can you do if butyrate causes some bloating? Um, change the type of butyrate uh, supplement. So, uh, you know, there's various types, there's sodium butyrates, there's calmag butyrates, there's tributyrin X, there's other tributyrins. So switch the company that you're using. Um, and then uh, I guess in, if you want to type in the chat, what company you're using that might tell us more. So for instance, a sodium butyrate includes a lot of sodium with it. So extra sodium in the gut can cause some people bloating. It can kill some uh, die off to uh, bacteria and things like that. Like if you like salt is one way to kill things. Like if you go pour salt in your yard, it'll kill a lot of your yard. So a whole bunch of salt going in there can be problematic for certain individuals. So we talked, I got to get back to the timing. We talked about the timing of digestive enzymes. What is the timing of tributyrin X? Um, so tributyrin X, our specific tributyrin, I'm not speaking on anybody else's, can be used anytime with or without food. In fact, we actually encourage people to take it right before bed. If you have an aura ring or a whoop band or a Fitbit, a lot of people will see extra deep sleep numbers. We're talking like a half hour or more increase in deep sleep if you take a capsule right before bed. Um, so I have pretty good deep sleep, so I don't necessarily do that. But Shay, my wife, does that. And that's part of her like perfect sleep ritual. So um, it, it doesn't totally matter with tributyrin X. Okay. Um, can you, do you have a bottle? Did you show the bottle? Yeah, it's right back here. Okay. So remember, he has a Facebook group where you can get your questions answered. Excellent. Thank you. And what makes your tributyrin different than all these other brands, Stephen? Just one more time. So for instance, it's like powdered tributyrins, to powder it, you need to cake it with something. And so most of them are 70% not tributyrin, 30% tributyrin. So ours is 99.9% .9 tributyrin as tested by the lab. And we in include a enteric capsule. We are still the only company with an enteric capsule as well. Enteric means it doesn't open until the pH is higher, in this case, higher than a seven. Um, the pH of your stomach should be like two to three, maybe four. And so the goal of the capsule is to get it through the stomach without any degradation of the capsule. We want that. We want all that 99% of that tributyrin next, that, that pure stuff to get into your intestines. And so the liposomal forms, the powdered forms, the delayed release capsules, these are all nice technologies, but they don't actually get it completely through the stomach, which is why I think tributyrin X sees different results. And how many capsules or, or gel, they're gel caps, whatever you want to call them. Um, how many do we take to start? Yeah, they're just these little guys. Yeah. Um, so most people just start with one, um, but everybody will have an ideal dose. Most people are between one and four per day. If mm -hmm. you're someone who has a ton of inflammation, you have uh, a lot of diarrhea specifically, you'll need more usually. Um, but most people fall between one and four per day. 
So Laura's saying, what's the average length time one would have to take tri X, tri beta and X for to heal leaky gut, assuming diet is clean, no grains, no coffee. Is it, but how long have you had leaky gut is the other? Yeah, one. most people are going to take a minimum three months probably because not only do you have to like remember you have to reproduce iap you have to rebuild your mucosal membranes you have to rebuild your tight junctions and your secretory iga and other defenses meanwhile we're hoping that that during that time frame the inflammation in your body is slowly coming down so you're less reactive less reactive less reactive so even if your leaky gut was quote unquote good to go on month one but your inflammation was still right at the bathtub level and then you got off the product and then you just I don't know, walked into your friend's house with mold or had a stressful day on the road or something like you could easily spill that inflammation too high, causing more, you know, gut related issues. So normally I say a minimum of, of three months. Okay. Everyone's going to be different though. Uh, well, can you give these products to dogs? Uh, we do have some, some adventurous folks giving them to dogs. Yes. Uh, I, I, not what they I'm not a vet. Yeah. So. Yeah, it was designed for humans. I'm not a vet. I don't know what the dosage is. Please, if you do it, send me an email. I, I won't mention your name, but I would love to know what happens. Okay. Um, I can't swallow. Please put your questions into the Q&A box, but I'll grab this one. I can't swallow capsules anymore. Can I remove the contents? Uh, you can remove the contents. It's going to smell absolutely terrible. Um, butyric acid is, is really rancid smelling, um, kind of like deep vomit smell. So... Um, uh, there's folks out there that we know uh, who that doesn't bother them. There's other folks that are like really bothered by that smell. Um, I would say that sun butyrate would be like the liquid, the best liquid option out there. Okay. Um, what is the enteric coating made out of? I was horrified to find out a lot of enteric coating contains phthalates. That's not how you say that word. P H T H A L A T S T E S. I know what it is. I just am having a hard time pronouncing that word. Uh, what is your coating made out of? So our coating is gelatin, pectin, and sorbitol. Okay. So everyone wants to know why is Tributernex not vegan or vegetarian? It's because in order to get a enteric capsule that is vegan and vegetarian, we have to use some kind of some nasty chemicals. And they're like not very natural. So this is the best natural solution out there. And I know sorbitol raises like red flags and the hair on the back of some people's neck who have really bad FODMAPs. I can promise you that 99 out of 100 people who have ever said, I can't believe you put sorbitol in there. I say, try it. And 99 out of 100 people take it. They don't have issues with the sorbitol. And in fact, it almost increases their FODMAP tolerance almost like right away. Oh, wow. That's cool. Okay. Uh, ha, 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 ha. Mark is saying, if you take antibiotics for SIBO, this is in theory can help your SIBO, but can this at the same time contribute to leaky gut? So antibiotics, do anti, do you think antibiotics lead to leaky gut? Not in, not in that sense. I, I think if you're on a course of like rifaximin or something for SIBO to try to kill it, it might be a great idea to boost your IAP during that cycle using curcumin, using tributin X, like just try to support the rest of your body during that time frame because you're going to be you're going to be creating LPS if the antibiotic works properly. Okay. Uh, if you have SIBO, do you have to get rid of all the bacteria before taking tributin X? So you just answer that. Sorry if you covered this, no. please. No problem. No problem, Annette. That's very sweet of you. Um, yes, you can take it. He's saying it's even a great idea. So here's, so Patricia, put your question in the, in the Q and A box, but sleeve surgery, if you're talking about the, um, like gastric bypass surgery, if that's what you're talking about, a lot of people with the guy, the stomach surgery that happens get SIBO. And I do not remember what the mechanism is or anything like that, but please be careful and make sure you talk to your excellent doctor about it and check into prokinetics as a way to mitigate uh, remission into SIBO if you are able to overcome it. Okay, so still some questions about, so the coupon information or the link information, remember the coupons applied automatically at checkout is in the chat and we have 10 more minutes. Uh, we did this one and, uh, Let's see. Okay, so 
this has to do with the daily like protocol, right? How many pills, meds, powders in a day are you suggesting? Now you have to understand, you open Steve's kitchen counter or kitchen cabinet and it's full <laughs> of supplements. Like this is a, you know, a health biohacker right here that we're talking to. I think they're like your, your, they're part of your food pyramid. Right. Seriously. So um, are you suggesting HCL and the other four? curcumin, L-glutamine, herbal powders, beta-glucans, also how much holozyme with each meal. I read that HCL can take a lot if low stomach acid and eventually wean down. Also, tri is tributyrin X constipating? Where does the tributyrin X come into the picture? Good luck. Um, so this is really important. So if you can go find this stuff on the internet, I still haven't like tried to like scrub it off the internet. I'm a, I mean, I make mistakes. I'm a human and I'm trying to learn as fast as I can about everything. The initial leaky gut protocols from our program solving the gut, which over 10,000 people went through, we had a lot of success and not everybody had success. Too many failures for my, for my taste. Um, those protocols were full of products like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars per month for yeah. products. Because back then we thought you had to have all these different variables. We thought we had to just do all these different things to get rid of it. And it led to extreme complexity and extreme cost and therefore worse outcomes. And then again, not all these things have true milligram dosages in humans to know what works and what doesn't. And so what I'm saying is for most of that, you can get rid of that idea, tributyrin X and a strong tributyrin product will replace the majority of that stack. Should you have known low secretory IgA? Should you have known um, issues with your immune system? Then you might also want to add in a beta glucan source, maybe even something like holoimmune that we make. Should you have low stomach acid, you'll want to add, you'll want to add in a Betaine HCL and HCL guards, the product we make. If you have enzyme issues and you're trying to heal leaky gut and SIBO, I think you should always be on enzymes, whether it's holozymes or not. Um, I think that's just a no brainer. It's going to make everything you do easier and better. So I'm not advocating anymore for these giant supplement stacks. I'm advocating for addressing the issues that you have going on for your body during the phases in which you're trying to heal. Okay. Do you take HCL with digestive enzymes at the same time? Yes. Okay. And no spectrozyme metagest with HCL and pepsin is not the same, is it? Um, it sounds like a product. I don't have that product label in front of me, but it sounds like a product that combines HCL and enzymes. Mm -hmm. I am wholeheartedly against those products. Uh, if you look at, at my last 14 years of helping people, Everybody has a different HCL dosage for their body. Your body's different than my body, your body size, your stomach size. So dial in your HCL with whatever your body needs and then dial in your enzyme needs with a separate product. This is experimentation, guys. You know, and talk to your providers, of course, but you, if, for those of you who are doing the DIY version of this to a certain extent, you know, you're going to have to track it and prepare to be like not super rigid right out of the gate because you're going to change by the way, right? And you, sometimes you might need more, sometimes you might need less. One of the great tips Steve has shared with us when we were doing the holiday edition of these webinars was when he knows he's going to go like have a good time and get off of his routine, he will before the party take colozymes and, you know, triple up on certain things. So make this every, every time I drink alcohol, I guess I forgot about alcohol. Alcohol is a huge risk factor for leaky gut. Ethanol breaks down the mucosal pathways as well as the tight junction. So every single time I take a drink, I take an extra tributyrin X because there's mouse data, several mouse studies showing ethanol induced leaky gut damage is, can be prevented using a butyric acid compound. Oh, uh, okay. So because you don't like digestive enzymes with HCL. Carl is saying, so does that mean not to take HCL with whole zymes at meals? No, no, no. They go together. So here's the thing. Um, I actually, part of the reason why my brain's a little messed up is like, one of my issues is that I do go down crazy rabbit holes and I want things to be as perfect as possible. That's why I know about the perfection is the enemy of good type of thing. Cause I've tried to do that before. I've taken 400, 500 pills in a day 
trying to figure this stuff out. Um, what I'm saying is that even if personally I or any other company out there who you buy into makes the most perfect product for your issue, it, if it's dosed incorrectly for your situation, it will not give you the results that the marketing or the studies suggest it will. And so we know that everything falls on a bell curve. I don't know if you remember that stuff from statistics. Essentially what it states is 34 to 36% of everyone falls on the tail ends of the bell curve and they probably need a different dosage, high or low than what everybody else needs. If you happen to be like a health warrior, you happen to be somebody who's DIYing it, chances are likely that you didn't fit the, the standard bell curve uh, deviation and you're going to be one of those hyper or hypo responders. So you have to be willing to test the dosages of the products you choose, whether it's HCL or enzymes. And so what I'm saying is when they're combined in the same pill, it makes it literally impossible. You could be a hyper responder to HCL and a hypo responder to enzymes. So you might need one HCL pill and four enzyme pills. But when you're combined in the same product, um, that figuring that out can be a lot harder. Uh, changing the subject a little bit. Um, must you avoid all grains? What about foods with leptins or dairy? I mean, so look, we, we can have the diet wars forever. And yeah. some people in this this right now are going to be like, it is all about lectins. It is all about salicylates. It is all about oxalates. Some people are hyper responders to these compounds. The majority of us are not. But when our gut is in a really bad spot, chronic inflammation, SIBO, leaky gut, low enzymes, low HCL, it increases the chance that all of these compounds could cause us issue during that time window. I used to eat dairy and immediately swell up. Like I couldn't breathe anymore. I used to have asthma. I no longer have those things. And so part of that is just healing my gut. And so there, there's certainly people on this show right now who have like an oxalate issue or a salicylate or a lectin issue. The majority of us do not if we have a healthier gut. Okay. Um, does histamine intolerance cause leaky gut? They're related. They're, they're deeply related. Yeah. I, I contemplated, so the research study that I walked everybody through today came out of VCU in 2020. I debated adding a fifth factor, which was histamine-related issues, mast cell activation syndrome, basically. Um, the issue is, is that um, the mucosal layers are partially responsible for the mast cell overreaction and the histamine overreaction. There are genetically people who do not break down. Um, they don't degrade histamine as well as sort of a separate issue. But the majority, I think, of the histamine sensitive folks out there are over making histamine because the mast cells are being exposed to just regular life too frequently. And so they're highly related and, and, and it's like really impossible to get rid of histamine related issues without healing leaky gut. And it's really impossible to uh, like not suffer some histamine related issues if you have leaky gut. Okay. Okay. Uh, five minutes, actually just a couple of minutes. Can a 15 year old take this? How big are the capsules? They're small. He showed it to you, um, before they're quite small. They're medium. I'm going to go with medium. And what can I do to help her swallow? Because I always have to open the capsules and break the tablets for her because she's not swallow them. You know what I would do for that? I would go to YouTube because you're not the only one. And I bet there's some tips on YouTube on how to swallow capsules and there absolutely are tips like about the liquid and the placement of your neck and all that. So um, that's what I would do. Please reiterate the four factors of the layers of the uh, gut lining, please. So we, at the top layer, we have intestinal alkaline phosphatase or IAP. Um, next layer, we have mucosal, like mucosal health thickness, all, all those things. Next, we have the tight junctions. These are things like zonulin, occludins, Claudins, there's a bunch of them. There's like nine or 10 of them. Um, and then we have our gut defensins. So there's three primary gut defensins. Secretory IgA is what most people talk about, is the most studied. There's also alpha defensin and beta defensin. And then it's very easy to have histamine, mast cell related disorders related to all this as well. Okay. Steve, thank you. Would you all pop some love into the chat for Steve? We really appreciate you. Keep up the great work. 
And for those of you who are uh, suffering, we are with you, we support you, we are thinking of you. Do not give up. And inch by inch, it's a cinch. You are making your own luck by showing up for these. I mean, that's a big deal. We know you have other things that you could be doing, but your commitment is inspiring to us. So we really appreciate it and um, really want to make sure that you get the support that you need as your own advocates, right? As your own educational resource. And then maybe you're educating your friends and your doctors and your nurse practitioners and taking it, you know, taking it to the streets. We love that part. So um, we'll send out a replay for you of this session. And we will also um, continue in those replays to continue to send you the link. Remember the coupon is automatically or the discount is automatically applied um, at checkout. All right, and Steve. If, and if there was like a really specific question that didn't get answered, like um, I saw like a corn one or something, just support at Healthy Gut. Uh, I have a team of health coaches. We want to talk to you. We love talking to our customers or potential customers. Um, and we specialize in people who are very sensitive and have not had success with other products. That's literally why the company exists. So please reach out. No questions wrong. Um, we'll try to get back to everybody as fast as we can. Okay. Smile for me for the screenshot. Great. Okay. We are done. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Talk to you soon. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Bye-bye.